I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you today a very good friend of Brigham Young University and of the Kennedy Center, Dr. Ira Sharkansky. We are very pleased to have uh, a man of his talent and his ability to be with us here at Brigham Young University, not just to present one lecture, as is often the case when we have visiting professors, uh, but to have uh, Dr. Sharkansky with us for an entire academic year. He is a visiting professor of political science here at BYU, uh, and he is a full professor of political science at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He is going to speak to us this morning on the subject of Israeli options and constraints, the question of a Palestinian state. Uh, he will provide some time for the end to answer questions. Again, I'm very pleased to have Dr. Sharkansky with us. Uh, we enjoy very much having someone of his wide experience uh, with us. And I think that he provides to our academic loaf here at BYU a much needed leaven. And I will ask Ira for my apologies for using that analogy this close to Passover. Uh, but it's in six weeks, so I hope that you'll forgive me. So uh, I will now introduce to you Dr. Ira Sharkansky, Israeli Options and Constraints, the Question of a Palestinian State. The theme of my lecture is going to be indecision. Uh, that's the situation in Israel. It is an indecision which reflects a government which is divided inherently in its perspectives and which is waiting for a couple of shoes to fall. Uh, one of those shoes uh, has to do with the Palestinians. Another of those shoes has to do with the Americans. There is a slight connection between my lecture this morning and what's going on in the United States Senate at this very time. The indecision in Israel reflects a difficulty, a series of difficulties, in a people making up its mind, which reflects not only their inherent tensions and disputes, but also the difficulties that they objectively face. This is not new. Uh, the same thing occurred in the ancient Jewish country uh, from 3200 to 1800 years ago. And just let me talk briefly about some what might be called very deep background to the current problems in the Middle East. Uh, geographically, we're talking about the same place. Uh, we are talking about a place which is affected by great power involvement. The old Jewish country couldn't make up its own mind about its own fate without concern for what the great powers thought. Uh, the Middle East, for somewhat different reasons, uh, remains one of the centers of the world's attention today. And the great powers of the world have not allowed the inhabitants of the Middle East to decide their own fate entirely by themselves. Another factor which returns to the historical stage is the Jewish country is weak and poor. Uh, it was, there was only a brief period of time in ancient history, the reigns of David and Solomon, uh, when the Jewish country was able to assert itself and be a power in the region. There's even some dispute as to how powerful it was then. Uh, for the rest of ancient history, uh, the country of the Jews was weak and dependent, had to find its way uh, in a very difficult situation. Uh, again, uh, the Jewish country is weak and poor. Uh, you only have to look at its uh, chronic balance of payments deficit, its dependence on one or another uh, foreign power to balance its budget, uh, its uh, uh, continuous economic and political problems uh, to uh, find that. Uh, the ancient country of the Jews had a mixed population. Uh, there are problems in relying on the details in the Bible, uh, but there's a fascinating set of censuses which is reported for the period of uh, Solomon, David and Solomon. Uh, which if you take the numbers literally, they show that the country was 89% Jewish. Uh, now it's 83% Jewish, leaving out the occupied territories, so things haven't changed very much. Uh, this mixed population 
uh, produces chronic tensions between Jews and non-Jews. And also, the mixed population is not only a mixture of Jews and non-Jews, but a mixture of Jews. Uh, I'm sure this audience knows ancient history well enough to recall uh, the tensions which existed between what could be described as cosmopolitan Jews and zealous Jews uh, in the time of uh, the prophets, certainly in the time of the Greeks. And it doesn't take too much imagination to see the same overlay uh, in contemporary Israel, uh, fitting the pattern of secular Jews as opposed to uh, religious Jews. Also, as in ancient times, uh, the Jewish country is affected by a vital and loud prophetic tradition uh, with outspoken criticisms of established policy and practice, complete with dire threats directed at those who do not respond to prophetic-like figures. Contemporary Israeli policy advocates do not, uh, for the most part, claim to be speaking in the name of the Almighty but on virtually every other aspect of their behavior, they sound pretty much like the Old Testament prophets. It's not easy to make policy in that kind of a context, uh, because uh, whatever the policy chosen is received with a great deal of shrill criticism and dire threats. Dire threats which get to the, if you don't do it my way, uh, the society and its population will be destroyed. That's a meaningful threat in Israel, which whose people came close to destruction only a generation ago. One sign of indecision in Israel is the recent election results. Uh, Likud can be described as having, winning, having won the election, but it only received 40 out of 120 seats in the parliament. The opposition party received 39 seats. Uh, and there are just about as many parties to the left of those two, just as many seats to the left of those two as there are to the right of those two. And there is a group of religious parties who might be thought of as being more aligned to Likud than to labor. Uh, but basically, the religious parties have another agenda. And so it's by no means clear who won the election. Likud ended up with an edge. But the edge is, uh, is a very small one. <coughs> I'm going to talk largely about disputes within the government having to do with security and international relations. Uh, but it's appropriate to remind ourselves, I think, that there are other issues on the Israeli agenda. The process of forming the government had to trip over some conflict between secular and religious politicians. <laughs> and the religious politicians elevated a number of issues that are very important to them. A legislation on who is a Jew according to religious law, further restrictions on transportation and public services on the Sabbath, uh, football on the Sabbath, uh, which didn't get a great deal of attention in the American media, but is very important in Israel, uh, where Football fans who like to go to a game on Saturday afternoon are very important in the constituency of the Likud party. <coughs> and financial aid for religious institutions. According to some reports, certain religious parties demanded a 12-fold increase in the allocations to be made for their schools and welfare institutions. Uh, this in the context of a, an economy which is still fearful of returning to uh, four-digit inflation, and which hovers on the brink between economic stability and economic chaos, uh, kept on the, on the preferable side of the brink uh, by $3 billion in U.S. government aid uh, each year. The election, of course, was in the context of the Arab uprising. Uh, that was the number one item in the election campaign. It remains the number one item most of the time on the national government's agenda. The, the indecision which I want to talk about focuses on that. 
On the one hand, the Labor Party ran its campaign on the basis of what was called the Jordanian option. Labor leader Shimon Peres saw King Hussein of Jordan as being the appropriate address uh, for Israeli peace negotiations. And Paris not only ran his three-month campaign on the Jordanian option, but he invested most of the four years since the last election in touting a Jordanian option. Uh, he was not helped when the King of Jordan indicated during the election campaign that he would not be a part of the Jordanian option. And so Paris lost his Jordanian gamble. Uh, he went into an election having put all his resources into something that was pulled out from under him, and the results were predictable, although not disastrous. Paris's party still ended up with almost a third of the vote, only one seat less than the party which uh, formed the government. In losing the Jordanian gamble, the Labor Party, or at least that wing of the Labor Party which Paris leads, is out of the network that makes security and foreign policy. Paris had been foreign minister. Indeed, in the previous government, he had for two years been prime minister in a rotation agreement. In the present government, there is no rotation agreement. Likud controls the Prime Minister's office. It also controls the Foreign Minister's office. Uh, Labor controls the Defense Ministry, but it's not Shimon Peres's wing of the Labor Party that controls the Defense Ministry. It's a, a more right wing, of the, uh, a wing further to the right in the Labor Party, uh, headed by Defense Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Today, the foreign ministry is continuing a policy of rejecting claims by the PLO that that organization has shifted its position. The foreign ministry and leaders of the Labor Party uh, criticize the PLO for failing to renounce violence within Israel and holding to the old Palestinian device of claiming that attacks against Israelis are not terrorism, they are the pursuit of national freedom. And uh, some Palestinian leaders continue to argue that there is no such thing as Israeli civilians, since all Israelis are uh, potentially or actually members of the armed forces. The foreign ministry and the leadership of the Labor Party continue to publicize uh, PLO assertions, typically before Arab audiences, that the long-range goals of the PLO have not changed. Also, Paris and the Labor Party and the Foreign Ministry publicize Arafat's threat to kill any Palestinian who advocates at ending the uprising as a gesture of accommodation, and that threat seems to have been directed against Mayor Frege of Bethlehem. Shimon Peres, although now he's the finance minister, still indicates some aspiration to finding or leading the Labor Party to find a solution for the occupied territories and the issue of the Palestinians. Peres himself says that he is not yet speaking with representatives of the PLO. He is aware that backbench members of his party in the parliament are speaking with Palestinians who identify with the PLO. Whether they're actually members or not is an issue that is left rather vague. Paris says that he is not willing to talk to the PLO yet, but that he supports his younger colleagues talking to the, the PLO. It's part of the waffling. Uh, that you find in the higher circles of the Israeli government, its members on major issues really don't know what to do. And so they do different things, or they do one thing and express support for something else. The government is not yet willing to talk to the PLO. 
Indeed, the government would object to the phraseology of my sentence. They are not willing to talk to the PLO. They don't include a yet in their, their assertions. Yet 55% of the population, according to one public opinion poll, it was published recently, want the government to talk uh, to the PLO. There are several parameters that affect the indecision of the moment in the Israeli government. One is Israeli-generated. One comes from the Palestinians. One comes from the United States. And the, the three factors triangulate and, and complement one another in producing a situation that invites indecision. First is the results of the election, even division between Labour and Likud. Second is a split within the Labour Party, between a right wing that rather really does not want to talk to the PLO, and a left wing that is not yet willing to announce formally that it's willing to talk to the PLO, but seems to be moving in that direction. Paris, of course, is the nominal leader of the party. He is right between those wings. Uh, his record would suggest that he's closer to the left wing than he is to, to the right wing. Even the left wing of the Labour Party so far has not come around to a posture that would indicate that they have a great deal to talk to the PLO about. Labor formally indicates that it's willing to trade land for peace. Likud, on the other hand, asserts that it's not willing to trade land for peace. It's willing to trade peace for peace and formalize something very close to the status quo as an agreement between Israel and its adversaries. Labor says it's willing to trade land for peace, but it's not clear how much land it's willing to trade. Indeed, a reading of what Labor Party leaders of various complexions have said over recent years would suggest that it isn't willing to trade very much land for peace. They haven't said that. I'm saying that as a result of how I read what they have said. Labor has indicated that it's not, Labor usually indicates, some spokesmen say different things, usually indicates that it's not willing to unassemble or withdraw Jewish settlements from the occupied territories. There are now 160,000 Jews living in the occupied territories, roughly 100,000 living in the neighborhoods of Jerusalem, that are new, neighbor, new neighborhoods created since 1967, which exist on land which only the state of Israel claims that is part of Israel. Every other government in the world, including the United States, has yet to concede that the new neighborhoods of Jerusalem where 100,000 Jews live are part of Jerusalem or part of Israel. The Labor Party makes very clear that it's not willing to go back to the 1967 borders. And on the rest, the Labor Party is silent. Another parameter is the United States. The United States is considering the, its policy in the, in the Middle East. The present administration is continuing the contacts begun at the 11th hour of the previous administration uh, with the PLO. Yet the present administration is close to siding with the Israelis in concluding that recent efforts to infiltrate fighters into Israel, terrorists if you want to use that term, uh, raise some serious questions as how completely the PLO has departed from its policy of violence. That's part of the, the third parameter coming to the Israelis from the PLO, and I'll return to that. The delay in filling top positions, not only in the State Department, but in the Defense Department, 
certainly contribute to the fact that the United States government has not yet announced uh, or even provide very clear hints as to what its new policy in the Middle East is going to be. It may take a while for that policy to be proclaimed. And when it comes, there is, of course, absolutely no guarantee that the Israelis will accept it, in part or in whole, or that the policy will be built on something that many Israelis will be able to take advantage of in pressing their government to accept it. Israel has a long record of turning down American initiatives, which is by no means completely uniform. One can look at the Camp David Agreement and tease out of that some conditions which may have to be present for the Israelis to accept an American initiative. And associated with Camp David is one factor that made that something other than an American initiative. It was an Egyptian initiative where President Sadat came to Jerusalem and talked directly to the Israelis, something the Palestinians had not yet done. And secondly, Camp David was an initiative which the Americans basically joined after the Egyptians and the Israelis started something and invested two years in negotiations. And it was a case where the American president had put all of his personal resources and energy into the, uh, into the process of negotiations. Uh, that distinguishes Camp David from the Rogers Plan, from the Schultz Plan, uh, from the Reagan Initiative of 1982, uh, from most of the American initiatives that the Israelis had felt free to to ignore or to turn down on, on their face. In other words, it may be that the Middle East has to become the highest priority of the American president. And making some guesses from this point, it's hard for me to estimate that that will be the situation in the, in the Bush White House under the international and domestic American conditions that are possible to see at this time. By no means a guarantee that whatever comes out of the White House will either be wise, much less supported by the President. Let me tell you a story that was told to me by the Israeli participant in it. Speaking of a ranking member of the Israeli government some years ago, who at the beginning of an American administration talked to the man who was appointed as national security advisor. And the conversation went something like this. Uh, Mr. National Security Advisor, we've seen in the newspapers over the years that the United States is willing to accept only cosmetic changes or minor changes in the 1967 bombings of Israel. What do you mean by minor changes? Particularly with reference to the West Bank. And the National Security Advisor responded, nothing more than 15 or 20 miles in, either dire in any direction. Uh, you go beyond the West Bank, uh, either north to south or east to west, if you're talking 15 or 20 miles. And so with that kind of advice that at one time came out of the United States White House, uh, one can only hope that that quality of advice does not, is not found the White House again. The, the second shoe that has to drop is the Palestinian shoe. Now, to some of you it's dropped already. Palestinian PLO has announced that uh, the PLO recognizes the legitimate rights of the Israelis to exist in secure boundaries. Uh, but for many Israelis, maybe most Israelis, uh, that shoe is not yet dropped. And the problems are several. One, there is, there is an inherent distrust in much of the Israeli population for Palestinians who are viewed as terrorists, 
in ways that distinguish them from other people that the Israelis would view as freedom fighters. It's not just that the Israelis have been the targets of the Palestinians, but that the Israelis, civilians, women and children, have chronically been the targets of the Palestinians. Secondly, uh, Israelis, and if we can read recent announcements of the State Department, Americans too, are not certain to what extent Yasser Arafat can speak for the Palestinians. To what extent he can discipline those Palestinians who do not accept his turn to peace and negotiations, if indeed his, his turn is a genuine one. In the words of the State Department, it's not clear whether Arafat can or whether he is inclined to uh, discipline uh, Palestinian uh, factions that do not accept a peaceful road to settle the problems in the Middle East. If he will not discipline them, then Israelis say to themselves, why deal with him? Uh, if he can't discipline them, then Israelis also say, uh, why deal with him? Uh, wait until there's a leader who can promise something closer uh, to security for us if we agree to negotiate seriously with him. Uh, while Israeli politicians should not wait for absolute guarantees because there are no such things in international relations, particularly against the background of many years of uh, conflict, uh, I think it's not unfair for them to expect a leadership that can do better than a current estimate of Arafat's capacity. Leaving aside the question of his intentions, which suggests that he can do with respect to control the, the more aggressive, the more violent, the more uncompromising factions of the PLO. Another problem for the Israelis is the fact that Arafat hasn't come to talk to them. The Israelis aren't making that easy. On the other hand, I'm not aware that Arafat has offered to come to talk to the, to the Israelis, even if they would provide him, even if they would make an advanced commitment to provide him with personal safety. In the absence of that, he looks too much like a politician who is trying to use somebody else to solve his problems. The Arafat or the PLO American nexus to generate pressure to be used against Israel looks to Israelis too much like uh, Chamberlain and Hitler deciding in Munich to give away Czechoslovakia. Since the Jews suffered from that even more than the Czechs, and the Israelis are very much aware of the historical analogy, uh, then Arafat is going to have to deal with that. Israel is not a powerful country, but it's strong enough to say no uh, when it feels it's being led down the garden path. Uh, to annihilation. And Arafat is just going to be, have to be more sensitive to the images which are too close to the surface in Israeli politics to be avoided. Somewhat beside the point of what I have to say today, but not entirely beside the point, is, uh, is Solomon Rushdie. Israelis who, who don't want to negotiate, who don't want to give up any land, and there are many Israelis who take this position, are probably viewing the Solomon Rushdie affair as the best thing that's happened to Zionism in 40 years. Insofar as it reminds the Israelis and Jews elsewhere and other people who might be friendly to the Jews about the elements of Middle Eastern culture that the Jews have to, have to deal with. You can say that that's an inappropriate analogy if you wish, but it's something that's boiling through Israeli politics. That's an objective fact. Uh, the issue, as you might expect, gets a great deal of prominence in the Israeli media. And while it's too early to say 
to what extent it will add to the power in Israel of those who uh, are reluctant to compromise with people they view as uncompromising, uh, the, the issue is, is boiling around and adds to the, the lack of decisiveness in the Israeli government. So what the Israelis are doing is, is waiting. The Israeli government is not forthcoming with initiatives of its own. It's waiting to see what the, the forces of power in its environment are. It's waiting to see how serious the Palestinians are. It's waiting to see how important Palestine is to the Bush administration. It's waiting to see exactly what demands uh, will come out of the nexus of the Bush administration and the PLO. The behavior of the Israeli government is something less than elegant. It's not popular. It invites a great deal of criticism from Israelis. A number of Israelis are, are acting very much like the, the Hebrew prophets these days. They're, they're extremely critical of the government, and they're saying that if the government doesn't make a proposal of its own, then dire consequences will be visited upon the, the country of the Jews, and the Jews might lose the whole thing. I left Israel for my visit here at Brigham Young in July. But in the months before that, I talked to a, a large number of Israelis, civilians and military people alike. I came to the conclusion that the status quo is by no means a popular option. But neither is anything else. The options being considered are a Palestinian state alongside of Israel, Palestinian state in federation with Jordan, doesn't seem to be wanted by either the Jordanians or by the Palestinians, a Palestinian state in federation with Israel, it's an idea which in my thinking has some possibility, uh, but for Israelis to offer it uh, would not add to its appeal among the Palestinians. Israeli annexation of the occupied territories has appealed to extreme groups, right-wing groups within Israel. Hasn't gotten very much attention from the center, uh, certainly not from the left of the Israeli political spectrum. The status quo is nobody's first choice. When you ask people about these other options, it tends to become lots of people's second choice. And so by default, uh, until there's something else that is clearly more attractive, uh, the status quo seems to be it. A word on the status quo, it also reflects indecision. The Israelis are trying to repress the Palestinian uprising. They're doing so in what I view as a moderate and a modest way. I would use the term humane. I would not use the term gentle. Considering the options, and maybe may be defined by how the, the Jordanians dealt with their Palestinian uprising in 1970, or how the Syrians dealt with their Syrian uprising uh, some years later, then the Israelis have been very gentle. Perhaps some 350 Palestinians have died. A number, perhaps as many as 10 percent, perhaps as many as 30 percent, have been killed by other Palestinians among those uh, 350. Uh, perhaps 20 Israelis have died. Uh, these, these numbers are, reflect uh, personal tragedies that are regrettable. Uh, but they, the numbers are not large, uh, particularly when they're spread over an uprising which has now gone on for 
uh, one year and four months. The army is beset with indecision. The government is beset with indecision. And the, the individual soldier uh, is left to sort it out for himself and decide uh, when to respond and how to respond with deadly violence to the demonstrations that he faces. Uh, it's not an easy thing for a soldier to do. And I can tell you from talking with many of them uh, that they are, are not happy with their duty. They're not as unhappy with their duty as they are when they are sent into combat against the conventional army. Uh, they come back shaken from dealing with the Arab uprising. They do not come back uh, with the same incidents of uh, battle fatigue uh, and shell shock. They come back from a, uh, from, from a war. Use of vi deadly violence, deadly force, is, is never pleasant. It's not pleasant to the Israelis. Uh, very few of them enjoy doing what they're doing. Uh, members of the government do not like sending soldiers against young people. Uh, but that seems to be the fate. And the Israelis have shown no sign of taking the advice which they were offered early in the uprising by Henry Kissinger, who told them to seal off the occupied territories from the international media and finish with the uprising in a week. The Israelis could probably do that, uh, but they haven't done it. Uh, and I think they, uh, for me anyway, get some credit for not having done that. I see from my uncorrected clock in front of me that there are probably another 15 minutes to go, maybe 10 minutes. I've forgotten which direction the clock is wrong, but uh, 10 minutes. Let's, let's use that time for whatever questions and comments you wish. It, uh, it was said a lot after the, uh, the invasion of, uh, of Lebanon that uh, as Arafat escaped, um, that he would be gone, that there was no more Arafat influence, that his, his influence in the PLO was going to vanish and, and we wouldn't hear much more of him. That was about, I would guess, five years ago, a little earlier than that. And, and uh, all of a sudden, we've, we've got him here, well, I guess not all of a sudden, but, but here he is again. To what do we owe the resilience of Arafat, or how is he able to do that, is my big question. And, and do you have any insight on how well, to bounce back? Only another story, again reflecting Israeli indecision. Uh, when Arafat was, was leaving Beirut, there is a story that he was, he was targeted by Israeli snipers. And the question was asked, according to the version I heard, it got all the way to the Prime Minister, uh, should we do it or not? And the Prime Minister said, uh, we are honorable people, Let, let's not do it. And so uh, the Israelis have themselves to thank. And I, I guess I think that that was a, a wise decision to, to take. Uh, I think you exaggerated what was thought about Arafat in, in 1982. And I think you may, you may exaggerate how powerful he is today. Um, I, I have a lot of self-doubts about the Lebanese war. Uh, I had at the time it was initiated, and I have now in evaluating it. But one of the things that you know, I am ambivalent about is that there are signs that the Lebanese war, or Israel's war in Lebanon, uh, destroyed the, the military infrastructure of the PLO. Uh, destroyed not only the arms caches, that is, destroyed the army militarily, but destroyed the army organizationally. And perhaps contributed to, if we can accept it at face value, at least Arafat's turn from violence to negotiations. Uprising more so than ever before. Has 
world opinion have changed anything in the situation at all as of yet, or are you still just, does it even make a difference up till now? All of the above. Uh, world opinion has changed. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, also, I would challenge you, it's not the, the, I forget the words you use, it's not the most critical time in world opinion. World opinion was equally critical of Israel during the siege of Beirut. Now, it makes some difference. The Israelis don't like to be the target of hostile world opinion. Uh, on the other hand, among the pressures on Israel, I wouldn't put that highest. On the as I understand the part of the Lebanon conflict, as the, as the PLO was pulling out, the Lebanese were very glad to get the PLO out of Lebanon, and they were, they were happy to have the Israelis come in if it was for the purpose of, of kicking the PLO out. My question is, where, was the, where did the breakdown occur? Uh, it occurred in the government, with the military, and what was the, where, was, where would the breakdown occur in the, in the ability to, to be able to cultivate this, this uh, positive attitude towards the Israelis and turn it into a... Well, you're, you're, you're right. When the Israelis walked into Lebanon, they were greeted with flowers. The civilians stood on the side of the road and threw flowers at them. Uh, that didn't last too long. And I don't know if there's anything that the Israelis could have done in order to perpetuate that. Uh, they were an outside force in a country that was... Uh, uh, than is chronically riven with its own internal problems. Uh, and it's not just that the Israelis met uh, Lebanese who were sui generis hostile to them. Uh, the Syrians are chronically involved, uh, deeply involved in Lebanon. Uh, and the Syrians uh, cannot control Lebanon themselves, but they can, they do have enough power and influence to, uh, to direct the Lebanese, uh, uh, especially the Druze of Lebanon, uh, against the Israelis. Also, at about the same time the Israelis were trying to make order in Lebanon, uh, the, the Iranian revolution was reaching a level of stability uh, that it was quite able to, to, to produce disorder in Lebanon. And so Israel was, did not just trip over its own incompetence, it, it encountered uh, hostility uh, deeply seated in the Lebanese uh, situation. Yeah, mine is a question more of a cultural perspective. Um, do Israelis see themselves as part of the Middle East, or do they see themselves as an island that came from a Western culture to be, to be placed back here? Well, now, something like 55% uh, of the Israeli population is and always has been Middle Eastern. Uh, that is, Jews who moved to Israel uh, from homelands in North Africa, uh, Iraq, Iran, Arabia, Yemen, uh, and other areas of the Middle East ranging from Afghanistan to Morocco. And those Oriental Jews, or Sephardi Jews, uh, make up uh, now some 55% of the Israeli population. Uh, the European Jews uh, began arriving in Israel and in, in Palestine in sizable numbers from 1880. Uh, many of the people who call themselves Palestinians also began arriving in Palestine in the 1880s, uh, coming from other areas of the Middle East. Uh, so who is a Palestinian is a very naughty issue. One can't rely on self-claim to settle it all. I would say that uh, the overwhelming majority of European origin Israelis uh, view the country as home. Uh, the generation now being born is second, third, fourth, fifth generation European. Uh, the language that is spoken at home is Hebrew. And uh, it's a situation that is much different from that of the Crusaders. And that is the analogy that is, that is, typically, that is typically drawn. Uh, the Israelis see themselves as there. Uh, they also, I haven't made a point of this, uh, find deep historical roots in the place. 
I don't think the issue is one that can be solved with historic proclamations. I was here first. Uh, but I would also argue that the Israelis' claim to have been there historically is no less good than that of the, the other people in the area. I'd like to ask about uh, Foreign Minister Sharonazi's visit in the last few weeks that we've seen um, to various parts of the Middle East. And, and he's been talking with uh, the Egyptians and the, the, uh, the PLO. And Israel. And Israel, right. What, what role do you see for the Soviet Union in the Middle East? And what role do you think they want to project there? It's another shoe that has to drop. It's not a major shoe. Let's call it a slipper. <laughs> uh, things are happening in the Soviet Union which we don't fully understand. Uh, very great things may be happening in the Soviet Union, by which I mean not necessarily positive. Big things may be happening in the Soviet Union that change the, the, the aspirations and the intentions of, of that society. Uh, there are many Israelis who Many Israelis uh, are very ambivalent about the Soviet Union. Uh, my family came from Russia. Uh, lots of European Israelis originated from Eastern Europe, if not Russia proper. Uh, for the most part, our feelings are not positive. But they're not entirely negative. Uh, Israel was created by... by... Uh, young Jews who left Eastern Europe and created a society in Israel not unlike that of the Soviet Union. It's a very centralized uh, government, socialists, whose expend the, gov the expenditures of the government and quasi-government entities are, are larger than gross national product. It's the most centralized political economy outside of the Eastern Bloc. Now, it is democratic, and in that respect, it differs significantly from, from Eastern Europe, but the, the cultural and the ideological links with Eastern Europe are there. And so, if the Soviet Union is making a turn and is willing to make a positive contribution to <coughs> negotiations in the Middle East, then there's an under undercurrent of... Uh, uh, a strater of, of support that can be generated uh, from the major parties in Israel toward that. I'm by no means saying that Israelis are about to abandon their linkages with the United States. I'm not saying anything close to that. Israelis are suspicious of the Soviet Union. They view it as, uh, as a font of anti-Semitism. Uh, they are worried about the large community of Jews in the Soviet Union. They would like to get those Jews out of the Soviet Union. But with all of that, there is something in the, the European-Israeli air uh, that says the Soviet Union may have something to offer here. Let's take one more question, please. At the, um, at the last PNC, I read an article on it, and it, um, the Palestinian National Council continued to call for an international peace conference. You didn't directly address that. How did the Israelis see that as a vital as an option? Good point. The Israelis are ambivalent on it. Uh, before the Israeli election, the, uh, the parties were divided. Labor was saying, that's the road to go. The Likud was saying, never. Now the, the Prime Minister has been heard saying things in support of an international conference. Now the particular makeup of the international conference that he'd be willing to go to is not at all clear. Again, I think the, uh, the question is a good one that, that should remind us all of the, the ambivalence and the ambiguities and the indecision uh, in Israel. What I've tried to do today is to explain the indecision and to some extent to justify it. You know, if I was making policy, and believe me, I'm an awfully long way from that, uh, uh, I'd say that, the, that it's time to wait to see what's really on the Palestinians' minds how serious, how capable Arafat is. Uh, I'd certainly want to wait to see what the Americans have to say. I'd also be inclined to, to let the Soviet pot brew a little longer. 
And I wouldn't want to preempt any, anything by a political proclamation at this point uh, that might short circuit a, a better deal that would come out of all of these parameters. Thank you very much.